In this, we're going to revisit the moment arm exercise biceps videos I first posted in 2010. In the first part, I briefly review the anatomy, active insufficiency, muscle torque, base of support, and barbell curls. I'll interrupt that with a comment, and then the second part explains how each variation of curl corrects some aspect of the basic curl. We look at Scott curls, machine curls, and incline curls. And at the end, I'll elaborate on the differences between these two pictures, the top from 1996 and the bottom from 2016. Hey, hey Bob, you're up. Biceps, two heads, two questions. Do you have to curl? And does the type of curl make a difference? The short answer is maybe not. And it does make a difference, but not what you might expect. The long answer starts with the anatomy. Two attachments on the scapula, merging into one on the inside of the radius. That means it crosses three joints, shoulder, elbow, and radial ulnar. Fully contracted position supinated, bent elbow, shoulder flexion. Fully stretched position, pronated, straight elbow, shoulder extension. The biomechanics texts are very clear that these are very weak positions, the insufficiencies that your body generally avoids in daily life. Let me interrupt myself to address the extremes of muscle length the fully stretched or passive insufficient or the fully contracted or active insufficient positions. It's not only those positions that interfere with muscle function. So it's not as if you have a flat level of muscle force and then you hit those positions and it falls off the table down to zero. For starters it never goes to zero because you can always hold statically. But in between these two positions you do have a, a peak of force. Now, while the peak is the strongest, there is a range of lengths around the peak where your muscle strength or function is relatively unaffected, at least compared to near the extremes. Now, outside of this, of this range, there is a crossover point where you're getting closer to the extreme positions and your function and muscle strength will be affected. It's a slope, not a cliff. Now the body normally avoids these extreme positions in daily life, but if you do some kind of concentration curl or some kind of extreme stretch position curl, you do run into these positions. Now if you load these areas, near fully contracted and near fully stretched, all you do is reduce the weight in your hand. Okay? You never flatten the curve out by developing more strength at the extremes, and you never invert the curve where you're stronger at the extremes compared to in the middle. In practice, when you do load these extremes, such as with a concentration curl or some extreme stretch position curl, you have to notice a difference in weight. Uh, nobody concentration curls, for instance, more than a good standing, standing curl. Now, while these curves are true, they are academic, literally. What we really need to know is, what are the joint angles and limb positions that are around the peak torque, and then in turn, what exercises load those positions? We're not concerned with loading here or here, but there are two strong biomechanic positions for the biceps. Now remember, the biceps doesn't attach to the upper arm, so if the shoulder moves, it changes the length of the biceps. One strong position is stretched over one joint, shortened over the other, stretched over one joint, shortened over the other, the so-called sawing action. So. The answer to the question, do you have to curl, is maybe not. If you're, if you're happy with the size of your upper arms, 
if you row, chin, pull down, or even deadlift heavy enough, you can omit curls and lose nothing functionally since all those movements load the sawing action. Functionally, the biceps aren't that important. Other muscles supinate, other muscles flex the elbow, other muscles flex the shoulder. If you avulse or rupture the biceps, you may lose some shoulder stability. Now, as far, that, that strategy may not work for your upper arms because the texts say that the biggest muscle in a chain will bear the load as a way of the body saving energy. And since the lats and traps are the biggest in those, cha in those chains, if you don't go heavy enough, there'll be no reason for your body to use the biceps. But that's biomechanics for the beach. Okay, so if the pull heavy strategy doesn't work for you, the other biomechanically strong position for the biceps with the shoulder fixed is reported at about 70 to 90 degrees of elbow flexion, right about there. Well, where's the sticking point in a barbell curl? Also at 90 degrees of flexion. So if you do a curl without a lockout, like so, it actually does a pretty good job of matching resistance torque to muscular tor torque, as opposed to this, which would be with a lockout, straight elbows, lifting up, and then resting at the top. Okay, so lockout, no resistance, no moment arm, difficult, no moment arm again and then with no lockout. Okay, some moment arm at the bottom. The effort and resistance are more evenly matched. Now what happens when you go too heavy or you get too fatigued? Okay, invariably you get some lean. Now some would call that cheating. No, this is cheating. Okay, that's a cheat. This is something else. Now, ordinarily, <clears throat> when your center of gravity goes outside of your base of support, like so, you should lose your balance. But you never see people curling, falling on their face. And when the barbell moves forward, it's the same effect as your center of gravity moving outside of your base of support. What happens is, <clears throat> as the center of gravity moves forward, the muscles around your spine pull your head and shoulders backwards to maintain balance. It's not the same as a heave or a cheat, it's involuntary. Okay, one fix is to use a split stance to give yourself a broader base front to back. So now, when the barbell shifts forward, your center of gravity stays within your base of support. And you don't lean. Now that's a low-tech fix. Let's take a look at a couple of higher-tech fixes. Let me correct one point here. The concentration curl is not the best example of working into active insufficiency. Not an entirely wrong analysis, but what's come to be called the high cable curl is a better example of a misplaced idea. Nautilus had made a version, and just Googling now, I see that the influencers have latched onto a cable version. Either way, it tries to work the biceps in the biomechanically weakest position but no training can change that. There's always going to be an extremely shortened muscle length, and it's always going to be weaker than the angle for peak muscle torque. The only justification for it has always been, and will always be, feel, speculation, and assertions. Then again, I don't see any real harm, so if you like those exercises, be my guest. Supinating dumbbell curls, on the other hand, are worth doing, because as the orthopedic surgeon told me after a biceps repair, active supination is necessary to keep that function. Moving on, Scott curls, machine curls, and incline curls. 
Another way to address the shift in center of gravity is with a so-called cantilever design. A cantilever is a structural member, such as a beam, that projects beyond a fulcrum and is supported by a downward force beyond the fulcrum. So in the Scott bench curl, right here, your arms would be the beam, extending this way, the bench pad is the fulcrum, and your body weight would be the downward force on one side of the fulcrum. Since the weight in your hand is less than your body weight, it no longer disrupts your balance. Now, next to that is a Nautilus version, um, but the cantilever concept, or the, or the Scott bench concept, has been used for just about every curl machine. But, early versions of both the Scott bench curl and the machine curls had a flaw unrelated to the center of gravity issue. Since the barbell is such a common tool, we're tempted to use it on the Scott bench, and early machines mimic that same hand position of full supination. The problem with full supination is that the elbow doesn't bend at a right angle. The radius comes up higher on the upper arm than the ulna, so your hand moves towards the center in elbow flexion. This is called what the texts call the carrying angle. So now if your arms are over a fulcrum in full supination, the carrying angle wants to direct your hands towards your face. But if you're holding a straight bar or, or machine handles, your hands are fixed. The distance between your hands are fixed. They can't move towards your face. And since your elbows are now pushing down into the pad, you get about halfway up and then you stall. Because while the elbow and hands want to move this way, the machine won't let you. You end up working against your own joints. Now, intuitively, bodybuilders realize this wasn't working, so they switched to dumbbells or an easy curl bar. And the equipment designs went the same way. The reason this works is that the carrying angle disappears outside of full supination. Now, I'm fully aware that Nautilus lore dictates full supination to work the biceps, but that's not entirely the case. Remember that the biceps attaches on the inside of the radius. <clears throat> so if your hand is pronated or neutral, the force from the biceps is right, wrapped under the radius and has to unwrap it before it can pull straight up. As long as your hand is slightly more supinated than neutral, but short of full supination, the biceps will be the prime mover and you won't run into the carrying angle issue. Here's, here's a recent design by Nautilus and Hammer did something similar that addressed the center of gravity and the carrying angle issues. Okay, Here is the fulcrum for the cantilever. So your upper arm rests on here. Your heavier body weight sits and here's the handles that you pull. And these axes for the mo movement arms aren't in line and they're angled to accommodate the carrying angle. Here are the most recent designs I've seen that address these issues. You've got independent axes to address the carrying angle. You've got a small cantilever effect. You have a pad here for your upper arm to rest against. And you've got a much broader base so you have a more stable center of gravity which of course now brings these curl machines up to the level of sophistication of this uh, dusty exercise. The classic incline curl. You have a broad base so the weights don't affect your center of gravity. You're already leaning back so the muscles around your spine are, aren't involved. You can supinate more than neutral, but avoid the carrying angle. And the sticking point matches the joint angle for peak muscle torque, especially if you don't lock out. One more thing, the head position, neck flexion, triggers the tonic neck reflex, which according to the text facilitates pulling contractions. Which curl you do primarily depends on which joints you need to protect or you can protect all your joints and do an incline curl or the machine version. In spite of the fitness cliches, 
Your choice of curl will have no effect on selectively shaping your biceps nor strengthening one joint angle over another. Muscle torque exists in a predictable documented pattern which, is ex which explains why your same biceps has to use different weights for different curls. You're simply loading a different point on the muscle torque curve. And if you look at biceps from the Arnold era, where each of the top guys had a different shaped biceps, Arnold versus Franco versus Bill Grant versus Frank Zane versus Boyer Coe and so on, they all did the same exercises. So if shape was malleable, they should have ended up with the same looking biceps and they obviously didn't. The one thing that will affect the shape of your biceps is to rupture one head off the scapula and not repair it. The biceps will then shrink down, reattach randomly, and just sit somewhere in your upper arm. Here's a look at my own biceps from 1996, two years before I ruptured it. And here it is now, about 11 years after rupturing it and not repairing it. And you can see a divot. Not a recommended strategy. Stick with the incline curls. Did you see those pythons? They don't look like that anymore. On the upper left, 1996, the best bodybuilderish shape I ever got in. But in 1998, I ruptured the biceps and triceps on the right arm in separate training accidents, which pushed me away from the muscle magazines and towards biomechanics and sports medicine textbooks. That research turned into the Moment Arm Exercise book in 2003, which the middle pictures are from. So five years after the ruptures, still some bulk, but the ruptured parts of the biceps and triceps had minds of their own and they wandered all over the place. By 2010, when I did these videos, the ruptured ends had reattached randomly and I was able to rebuild a bit. The waistline, I have no excuse for. Now, another event adding to my biomechanics experience was in 2016 when I completely ruptured my subscapularis and tore my supraspinatus, uh, not an exercise injury this time. At the top left, after the accidents, but before the surgery. Top right, just after the rotator cuff and biceps repair. And the bottom pictures are during the first months after the surgery. With my arm in a sling and strict instruction to allow the repair to take hold by not moving, not only did the muscles atrophy and the posture fall apart, fluid accumulated at the bent elbow. So much of 2017 was spent recovering from the surgery, then getting the scar and fluid out, then stretching the locked up areas, and then therapeutic exercise for the shoulder. So for 2018 and 2019, I was holding back a bit in my own training, at least for the upper body. I was training enough to not get too fat and being very cautious with upper body exercises. In January of 2020, we took pictures for Joint Friendly Fitness at the top left. But then through 2021 and 2022, I started feeling more comfortable pushing harder again. Um, now, I still don't think I'll be able to duplicate 1996. For one thing, I'm almost 30 years older with different priorities. But I also notice among older trainers, especially those not using pharmaceutical or hormonal help, that it just becomes very tough holding on to the same amount of muscle as your younger version. Which doesn't mean I won't train. I'll train appropriately given what I've learned about biomechanics influence exercise, but my expectations are a bit different. And speaking about what I've learned from biomechanics and exercise, please feel free to look through this joint friendly fitness channel for more biomechanics influenced exercise videos. And of course, Amazon for the Kindle version of Moment Arm Exercise 20th Anniversary, as well as the print and Kindle versions of Joint Friendly Fitness.